This is Darren Pulsifer, and welcome to Rise of the Stack Developer, where the convergence of DevOps, security, and cloud-native technologies are changing the way products are developed. In today's episode, we're going to talk about increasing Kafka throughput using DC persistent memory. In my role as a systems uh, architect or solutions architect, I have helped a lot of different companies look at um, data ingestion problems. It tends to be one of the biggest things that they look at. How do I get data into my data center or into my cluster, Hadoop cluster or whatever it is, where I can actually derive some value from that data? So we started looking at uh, the common problems that they have with ingestion and congestion is one of the biggest problems. So we started looking at how can we utilize some new technology coming out of Intel, Intel Optane DC persistent memory to help us with this. So in this episode today, we're gonna talk about that. What can I do to decrease that uh, bottleneck of ingestion into your data center? So let's take a look first off at what a typical service stack might look like in a um, data center, for example. So we're gonna use the automotive industry as an example. It's a very interesting case. Everyone's uh, looking at autonomous vehicles, which is, oh, so much data, terabytes of data a day. We're gonna look at something more available today, which is CAN data, which are sensors that are in the car. And we're talking like engine sensors, things that almost every car has had over the last 10 years. So we want to get the data from the cars, bring them into our data center and then run analytics for predictive um, maintenance and things like that. Right. Even knowing the temperature out there on the road and things like that. We can get all that information from the CAN data. But I got to get all that data into my data center. And that data ingestion is the key part, because once I get the data into the data center and a preliminary catalog done, then I can pass it to an annotation engine, to deep learning or analytics, or I can run it through an alert system, a streaming um, alert system that, you know, can alert a... uh, Maybe an ambulance if a car gets in a wreck, things like that. So there's lots of things that can happen once I get the data in its first step of being ingested into the data center and high level cataloging go. So that ingestion part is key. So we we look at lots of different technologies for ingesting data. One of the most popular ones out there today is Kafka. Now, Kafka was invented and developed and then open sourced by LinkedIn. You say, well, LinkedIn doesn't have a lot of external data sources, but it actually does. Every browser, every person that has a phone or has LinkedIn on a browser, whatever it is, is a data source for LinkedIn. They have a very um, interesting architecture that is more event driven than anything. And so as an event happens on your phone, they're ingesting that and then the back office stuff happens based off of those events. So very similar to the types of things that we're seeing in the automotive industry, Internet of Things, or even in cybersecurity. When I'm ingesting logs, you know, data logs, uh, systems logs from all over the place. So Kafka has a really a big following. It does a really good job at scaling out. Um, I can add more and more machines to get more throughput. Um, But as you'll find out, sometimes I need even faster throughput with fewer machines. And there's some cases we're going to talk about about that. But let's first take a look at what the Kafka architecture kind of at a very high level. It is based off of a pub sub hub design pattern where I publish data onto a bus and then I subscribe to data where I can consume that data. So anyone that publishes data to the bus, it's just publish it and forget. And then the consumers, oh, data arrived into the bus, I now consume it. They use the concept of producers and consumers instead of publishers and subscribers, but it's the same concept. A producer will produce data onto the Kafka bus And what's cool about Kafka is it has the concept of topics. So now I produce data on a specific topic and then a consumer can register for a topic to watch 
or multiple topics. So if I'm a consumer of data, I can then say, oh, I want to watch for a topic that is a, a certain event or in the world of the automotive industry, they actually use topics corresponding to make and model and year of a car because that gives me the ability to then consume that data because the can data in make and year model, make model and year may be different from year to year. So very easily, I can look at the VIN number as the data comes in. I can say which producer to use. That producer produces it on a specific topic and the consumer from then knows how to read the can data and store the can data in a very uh, specific way. Now, the way that they get scale is they have the concept of partitions for each topic. A partition can reside on multiple servers, so that gives me the ability to ingest that data across a cluster of machines. So very good architecture. Um, there are some a, a big community around this, and there are some great tools out there to help you look at best uh, practices for performance and throughput um, tuning. So let's take a look at some of the big highlights of performance tuning. Because we had some customers that they were running into some bottlenecks with their Kafka clusters, and they want to know, hey, we, we want to uh, be able to do this faster. So what can we do? So if you look at best practices, you first want to look at your buffer size of the producers. Um, and to look at that, you want to look at the message size, your typical message size that's coming into your producers. Now, luckily, in most cases, you've got a producer that's tied to a specific type of data coming in, whether it's a log file or an event in a log file, pretty small, typically, you know, 1K. And that's where this really came out of, right, is these small message sizes. In the automotive industry, CAN data is about 240 kilobytes. Um, but it's not 24 kilobytes and 240 kilobytes. It's normally always 240 kilobytes in that range. So because I know the message size, um, pretty close message size, I can set my buffer size to be a multiple of that size. So I'm not splitting messages across buffers. This helps in increase your performance of your producers um, actually quite a bit. Then I have a batch size and the batch, batch size can change based off of the message size and how much memory you have on your on your machine because your buffer size is there and then you want to send things in in a batch mode um, from your producer into the uh, Kafka brokers. This will make your broker, your producers run faster and your brokers be more efficient. And then the last thing that people look at is how um, because Kafka uses temporary space, it's called Kafka logs, to store persistently these messages as they come in. What we found, especially if you're using spinning drives, which I, you know, I call spinning rust after years of, of doing spinning drives and counting spindle, spindle counts and things like that. We've moved away from that into SSDs, but what we still find is if I spread my logs on partitions across multiple drives on the same system, I can get better throughput because my bottleneck is that SATA uh, bus, right, that I have, right, or my NVMe bus if I'm using NVMe drives. The faster the drive, the better off I'm going to be. So those are the things that are best practices. A great example is um, LinkedIn. They actually do a great job uh, with their optimization. As of last year, they uh, published these results. They can do about 13 million messages per second, and they have 1,100 Kafka brokers. Uh, those are servers running Kafka and in over 60 clusters. So pretty big configuration. They're doing about 2.7 gigabits or gigabytes per second in their cluster. So this is a lot of data being pushed through um, their um, solution. So very cool stuff. If I extrapolate that, what LinkedIn has done and published, to an automotive customer, let's say one of the largest automotive customers has 100 million cars out there and they want to connect those to their data centers and their data is coming in at 100 and, or 240 kilobytes per second. This is for CAN data. If I'm talking 
image data and things like that. That's a whole nother story. Um, now we're talking um, megabytes, gigabytes, and terabytes of data, depending on how much you want to grab. Um, but let's just stick with the CAN data first. Then we're looking at about 1.6 million messages per second, or, and this is the real big one, 800 gigabytes per second, not bits, but gigabytes per second. So the, the 1.6 million messages per second, not a problem. LinkedIn is doing 13 million messages per second in their cluster, so not an issue there. But when we look at the throughput of the amount of data that's moving in, now we are running into, oh, wow, 800 gigabytes or gigabytes per second. That's a big deal. Uh, so how big, if I just use their numbers, how big do my clusters have to be? So without any optimization, just using their numbers, I would need 44,000 brokers to handle all the data coming in. Uh, that's a lot of machines, right? Or 2,400 clusters. Now, it hasn't been optimized for larger message sizes like 240 kilobytes. So we looked at that. What could I do for optimization? We think we could decrease it by tenfold. So we can get down to 4,400 brokers and 240 clusters. Holy guacamole. That's still 120 or so racks of machines just to ingest the data into a data center or two sets of data centers. That's still way too big. It's still a bottleneck, the ingestion. So we started looking at some technology that we had at Intel. Um, some of that technology is actually really cool. Technology, new stuff called Intel Optane DC Persistent Memory. And this memory is really interesting stuff, right? It has... Um, memory modules that are 128, 256, and 512 gigabyte modules. They're in DDR4 format, so they fit in a normal DDR4 slot. Um, they don't run quite as fast as DDR4 memory, but with some configurations, they can act as fast. But it gives you like a second tier, an L2 cache configuration where you use your DDR4 as your cache, and you use this larger dim size for affordable memory, large amounts of memory. Um, so large that in a two socket system, we can go up to six terabytes of RAM in a, in a one server, one U server, which that's pretty incredible, right? They're hardware encrypted, which is really nice. So it gives me the ability to extend the amount of memory I have in my machine dramatically, and it's persistent memory as well. So that's pretty cool too, and we're gonna show how we can use that persistent memory to help us with um, some Kafka performance improvement. So let's take a look at the different memory modes that um, you can use these modules with. Now, if you just plug these uh, uh, persistent memory modules in, you always have a configuration where there's a, a DDR4 DIMM, um, and it's a kind of a one-to-one -one match where uh, you've got one DDR DIMM and then a PMEM um, attached to it. And I'll show you a configuration of that. But that memory, that persistent memory that you have can work in memory mode where I'm just extending the current memory and I'm using the, DD, uh, the DRAM as your cache and then the persistent memory is your main memory. Or I can run it in app direct mode, which means that my application can write directly to persistent memory. And if I turn the machine off and turn it back on, it's still there. So instead of using maybe a temporary space in a file system, which a lot of programs do, Kafka being one of them with Kafka logs, I could change Kafka to write directly to the persistent memory, surpassing all of the I.O. bus, all of the subsystem that you have to write things out to a file system. And I imagine how much faster it could go. It could go a lot faster. So here are the two memory modes that I have. And then in app direct mode, there's another thing I can do if I'm running the memory in app direct mode. I can actually use it as a RAM drive. You heard that right, a memory drive. So I can actually create a file system on this persistent memory, which is sitting on the DDR4 bus instead of the I.O. bus, which is a lot faster, and I can treat it like a file system. So those are the different things I can do with, um, 
with this persistent memory, with this persistent memory module. So, so very cool stuff. We're going to show how we can play with these different modes to get optimal performance out of Kafka. So let's first take a look at how do I use this memory? How does it fit in the slot? So the best configuration that is out there, if I have a two socket machine, is what we call a 222 configuration, where I've got, I filled up every slot of my DDR4 memory with one um, DRAM module for every PMEM module, persistent memory module, so that they're paired, basically. This configuration gives me the highest capacity and the highest throughput, because I'm utilizing all of the DDR4 memory um, with a persistent memory behind it. So the DDR bus is going to be optimal in, the, in this case. So I'm going to get the fastest performance with the most um, memory. So that's the configuration, of course, I want to use. Now, I would go with other configurations based off of price and what you want to do with that. Now, what's really cool about this memory is I install it. And as it, once I install it physically in the machine and I boot up the machine, it sees it all as memory. And in fact, I remember the first time that I did this, uh, we got the memory modules in our lab. They only gave us 128 gig memory modules. Uh, so, and I had a two socket system. I filled the, I filled it up all the way and I had 1.5 terabytes of RAM. I was like freak, freaking out, right? I've never had a server with 1.5 terabytes of RAM in it, right? Uh, later on, we got uh, the two, the 512 modules and now I have six terabytes of RAM in my machine and I, I don't even think twice about it, which is really kind of crazy. So you turn it on, it comes up. I got six terabytes or 1.5 terabytes of RAM. Uh, there's lots you could do with that. Now, there are tools that are available in the Linux kernel and also in the BIOS where I can decide what I'm going to do with that persistent memory. Run it in app direct mode and I have to do this at the kernel level. I can't do it at runtime because you're going to run into problems, right? Some of your persistent memory is in memory mode and some is in direct app mode and you want to switch that around. Uh, you're, you, you'd have to vacate memory. It, it just becomes too complex. So I can run these commands on the Unix shell, no problem, or at BIOS, and then it requires a reboot uh, once I do that. So just keep that in mind. The first command that's up there is called IPM. So Intel Persistent Memory Controller, that's the easiest way to remember it. This lets me configure the Optane DC Persistent Memory to say what percentage of that persistent memory is gonna be run in AppDirect and what percentage is gonna be run in memory mode. Pretty easy. So I can say I want 50% of my persistent memory in AppDirect mode and the other 50% use in normal memory. So it looks like normal memory on my system. And then I use another command called NDCTL, which is a non-volatile memory device controller so that I can create um, namespaces and regions for this non-volatile memory. So I can use that non-volatile memory in um, my uh, applications in my um, operating system. So I can create file systems out of it. I can uh, attach applications to it, whatever I want to do. So, and I do that through namespaces and regions. You can look up more on this um, out there. There's plenty of documentation on NDCTL and IPMCTL. now play with the configuration of the machine and see how I can leverage this persistent memory to best help me with my ingestion problem, right? Which was, hey, I've got a lot of um, data coming into my Kafka brokers. How can I best utilize um, this persistent memory? Am I going to get any benefit from it? So the first approach I took was, okay, I know about buffer sizes and batch sizes. So I'm going to increase the amount of memory that's available to my broker. And then once I do that, then my broker uh, should be able to consume more data and I'll have bigger buffer sizes. So that should help me with ingestion. So on this machine with 1.5 terabytes, I increase all my um, 
buffer sizes and my heap size. I do all that. No code change to Kafka at all. Right. I just it's just configuration changes when I start up Kafka brokers and producers and all that. So that's the first thing I did. And I got no performance change. Same same thing, because eventually it has to write things out to a drive and the drive becomes uh, the Kafka logs become my bottleneck. The next thing I looked at was, all right, Kafka's open source now. Why don't I look at Kafka and see how easy it would be to write directly to persistent memory instead of Kafka logs? So I started looking and went, whoa, I'm going to have to rewrite Kafka. Uh, so major code change. Didn't want to go through that. It's not cost efficient. I needed more time. Maybe it'd be easier with persistent memory to completely write the whole subsystem over uh, from scratch. Didn't want to do that. So the last approach I used was, hey, what if I created a persistent memory file system using the persistent memory? And I'm only going to take half the persistent memory. I'll use the other half to keep my buffer sizes large. And create a file system and use that for my Kafka logs. So that's what I did. I did the last one. I thought low hanging fruit. We'll see what we get out of it. Maybe we'll get performance improvements. Maybe we won't. So in order to make sure that I was testing the performance of just the Kafka logs and not bound by network or any other things, I decided to isolate my performance variability by limiting the test to one broker on the same machine as the producer. That way the network's not involved. I don't have conflict uh, with the brokers. I just have one broker running. So I'm, I'm pinpointing specifically the Kafka logs as my bottleneck. So that's what I did, All right? I ran some tests there. And then I also ran producers and consumers mixed to see what would happen there. And then I wanted to find out what my pass-through rates were on all this. That was my first set of tests that I did. Of course, after that, then I set up a full cluster with the same configuration of my fastest performance. And I'll show you those results as well, where I have a real Kafka install with um, um, redundancy of um, servers. I've got, you know, three to five servers running. I've also got multiple partitions, all those things that you would normally have in a Kafka high availability cluster. But first, we want to isolate it first. So first approach, as I mentioned before, was I did a 50% persistent memory uh, into app direct mode. And the other 50% was still running um, as normal memory. So I went from 1.5 terabytes of memory down to about 750 gigabytes. Oh, my goodness. Only 750 gig. <laughs> still a lot of memory. And... 750 gig of this persistent memory file system. Pretty cool. Now, because I have two sockets, two regions were created when I did the persistent memory because they don't want to can create a namespace that spans the different sockets because that would now include UPI traffic, which I don't want to do. I don't want to have regions from CPU2 talking to regions up in CPU1, right, directly that would slow things down. So for app direct mode. Um, so this was really easy. It created two regions. I mounted two persistent memory drives, um, 300 and, uh, you know, 300 and something, right? Almost 400 uh, gigabytes each. And that was plenty of uh, uh, space to do performance testing. So I ran a bunch of performance tests. I ran them at lots of different uh, message sizes. Optimal for... Um, Kafka is 1K. That's what LinkedIn primarily uses. So it's optimal for there with no configuration changes, just standard Kafka brokers with the standard configurations they give you. And you can see that the highest throughput is with the 1.5 or, or the one kilobyte per second, which is exactly what we would think. Uh, for our test, we were trying to go from one kilobyte all the way up to 900 kilobytes and see what my total throughput was. And they're all within the same general area. I ran it on SATA drives and we were getting around 150 kilobytes per second, which is about what you would normally get on a single broker. Uh, we then ran it against Intel's Optane NVMe drives. Uh, which did really well. It doubled the speed 
um, from the um, the SATA drives, which is what we expect. And then um, we ran it with the um, persistent memory drives. And with this, we got another doubling of speed. So the persistent memory drives were four times, approximately four times faster. Um, as the number of producers went up, um, I saw I could run 10 concurrent producers with one broker at its peak. And I saw uh, numbers that were three and a half to four times faster than your typical SATA drive. Not percentage points, but four to five times, three to four times faster. Pretty dramatic, right? So this is a really good test, right? We we found out really quickly, yeah, those Kafka logs make a big difference if they're on really fast drives. So one of my problems, though, was I only had 350, well, 700 and uh, 50 gigabytes. And I was filling that up within like five minutes when I'm running, um, you know, 40 producers or 10 producer, whatever the number was. I was filling these drives up way too fast. So over the weekend, I reconfigured my box to run in 100% direct out mode instead of 50%. So I made the changes with IPMCTL, which is the Intel Persistent Memory Controller command in Linux. And I said, hey, I want 100% in app direct mode and 0% in memory mode. So now I'm using all my DDR4, none of my persistent memory in memory mode, it's all app direct mode. And I create those persistent memory drives again. So now I doubled my capacity of my persistent memory drives because I went from 50% up to 100%. And I said, okay, I wonder what's going to happen now. Let's run the tests again. I'll run them longer and we'll see what happens. So I run the tests again and I find amazing performance, even faster than before. Uh, the performance I get is really fascinating. When I'm at 10, bro uh, 10 producers, the numbers, oh, it's about 10 or 15% faster. But as I keep adding more and more producers, the numbers keep going up instead of leveling off like I had before when I was running 50% app direct mode. So at 100% app direct mode, I can now, before I start topping off, and even when I top off, it just flattens. It doesn't start going down. I'm topping off at almost 10x the performance of a SATA drive, 10 times faster, around two gigabytes per second. Two gigabytes, that is really fast. In fact, if you take that, that's about 16 gigabits per second. But because I don't have my network card involved here, I'm not bound by the network. So I found that um, this has really helped quite a bit with my ingestion. I am now 10 times faster than what I was before. And you can take those numbers that I had before of 4,400 servers and bring that down to 440 servers, theoretically. So now we had to test this in a cluster. <laughs> Right. So testing this in a cluster meant a lot of different things, because in a cluster, I've got a lot of communication across the network. And I'm also hitting these drives as well as I'm sharding my data coming in and spreading it across multiple partitions across multiple servers. And the results that we got were very fascinating. I first ran it on a one gig network and my numbers went down. And I found out that my drives were not the bottleneck, it was my network. So then I ran it on a 10 gig network and my numbers did not get up to the two gigabytes per second, but they got up to about 1.2 gigabytes per second, which is around 10 gigabits per second. Very fascinating. And then I also did one more optimization. I put all of the inter-broker communication where the brokers are sharing data back and forth to have consistent state on their own network, another 10 gig network. And what I found there was my performance went up marginally, right? Because my network is being swamped 
but my drives are still not the bottleneck anymore. Now, I have not run this on a 40 gig or 25 gig or 100 gig network yet. We're still in the process of looking at that. But what we found with Kafka is there's a a major improvement in using a persistent memory as a file system for Kafka logs. And we think there are lo lots of other opportunities for other tools that are out there, maybe Elasticsearch, maybe um, Docker overlay uh, networks and uh, Kubernetes overlay networks that use temporary space in the same way. Thanks for listening to Rise of the Stack Developer. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe. Give us five stars and let other people know. If you want more information, like tutorials, videos, white papers, check out our website, riseofthestackdev.com. Until next time, go out and build a new world, one stack at a time.